Hello everybody and welcome back to the Zodcast. This is going to be episode 11. Today is Saturday, September 24th, 2020. Sorry it's taken a while to get this one done. I wanted to get it out a little earlier, but um, as you know, I'm writing a book about the Yuba County Five and um, that's getting better and better, finding out even more about the backstory to that case, which is just completely fascinating. So uh, be looking out for that book. It should be coming out soon. Get it done, hopefully, here in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, definitely got some Zodiac stuff to cover. If you saw the uh, photos in the beginning of this, you'll see one where Sandy Panzarella passed away. And I didn't know that. I went looking. Uh, something made me think about him. And I went looking for him. And I saw his obituary. I knew he was getting up there in age a little bit. And that he had Parkinson's disease. And... Um, didn't know that he had finally passed away, but he did, and I'll read that obit now. And it reads, November 8, 1939 to August 31st, 2020. Santo, Sandy, Paul Panzarella passed away on August 31st, 2020 after a lengthy illness. His passing was a few months shy of his 81st birthday and a few days shy of his 42nd wedding anniversary. His wife, Jan, was by his side throughout, even though... Family and close friends knew he had been ill for many years. The relief of seeing his suffering end does not negate the grief felt with his passing. Sandy was a life force of intellect, passion, and vision. He saw a future that few could see back in the early 60s when he and a few close friends started a computer company called Science Dynamics Corporation. He never lost sight of the big picture or seeing himself in it. He inspired many to think big. His three children... Tracy, Patrick, and Andrew take that spirit into their own lives and in turn have passed it along to their children. I won't read the the children's names. And it says, uh, Sandy's legacy will not only include his wide array of successful achievements, but he will best be remembered and kept alive through the people he influenced and the lives he touched. After his passing, numerous stories were shared that painted colorful memories of who Sandy was from his boyhood in Rochester, New York, to joining the Navy, to following the lyrics of the Beach Boy song, all the way to Hawthorne, California, to hitting the links at Bel Air Country Club, or boating at Priest Lake, Idaho. The greatest stories told are the ones filled with love. Whether you believe death is an ending or a beginning, love lives on forever. No matter how much we miss someone, we can find them in a memory, a song. As long as Sandy isn't singing, a place or a moment, Sandy loved life, and that spirit is eternal. No services are planned at this time. Donations may be made to Parkinson's.org. Go live your life to the fullest. That's all it says. Kind of strange they're not having a service. Maybe that's due to COVID-19 or something like that. But, uh, yeah, I did note uh, that that Panzarella had Parkinson's. That's why he sounds so monotone in his name was Arthur Lee Allen video where he, you know, kind of has that that affected speech you know some people thought maybe he had had a stroke or something it's not it's just uh that was an effect of his early onset parkinson's and he had it for all those years so i know back in the day he actually had this loud booming voice so uh it was definitely an effect of the parkinson's and of course people don't know sandy panzarella was don cheney's friend from cal poly pomona and that was the same time that uh, cheney had met ron allen and, of course, Ron was uh, Arthur Lee Allen's younger brother and all the rest is history. And, of course, also Sandy Panzarella was uh, Cheney's boss at the time. Cheney came forward with his allegations uh, about Arthur Lee Allen being the Zodiac in the summer of 1971. It was actually July of 1971. So, uh, yeah, kind of sad passing on that. And, you know, and going back to Panzarella, I know people speculated was he involved in the in the murders or whatever. And they were, you know, him and Cheney were obviously good friends. And uh, I really don't think so. I I did a heavy dive into Panzarella. He was a busy guy building that company and all that. I really don't think that he was involved. I think he just believed Don Chaney like everyone else did. I think think Don Chaney was a master manipulator. And as smart as Panzarella was, I just think he believed Don. It's like uh, Panzarella said. He said Don Chaney is intellectually honest. Whatever that means, that's what Panzarella Panzarella believed. And... um, and Ron Allen, his brother, and his sister-in-law, Karen Allen, uh, both you know, said that Don Cheney would, would not uh, be someone that would be known to, to lie about anything. But uh, obviously, Don Cheney lied about a lot because there's so many examples of that. But you know, going back to Panzarella, some people thought maybe he was the Sandy they were referring to with the, uh, with the Dominguez Edwards beach murders that happened in 1963. 
Well, I, I don't think that's the case because if you look at the description of the Sandy that, that was a suspect in the Beach murders, it said he was around 18 years old in 1963 and Panzarello was 24 in 1963 going by his birth date. Uh, the Sandy character from the Beach murders was also pretty small. It said he was a... I think that it said he was 150 pounds and 5'8". Well, Panzarell is definitely a lot taller than 5'8", and he would have been when he was 24. So there's really nothing there tying Panzarella, even though he went by the name Sandy, to the Sandy from the Beach Murders. There's, there's really just nothing there. Uh, but the Beach Murders are interesting, and they definitely need a bigger look. I think of all the non-canonical Zodiac crimes, I think the Beach Murders is most likely the Zodiac. I can't say if it is or not, but I think it's got the best chance. Uh, yeah, I really lean away from Riverside. I personally do. Uh, but uh, of all of them, I think the Beach Murders are, are, are very interesting, just with, you know, with the 22 round and stuff like that. I think it's probably a bigger person that was involved in that anyway than this Sandy suspect because it's. I think it said, and it's been a while since I've studied those, but they drug the bodies up to that little shack at the beach maybe 20 yards or so and and uh bobby dominguez was a pretty big guy he was a football player a standout football player uh that year in high school and they they dragging his body up the slope to that shack would, wouldn't have been easy for a guy weighing 150 pounds if they got that description right on the sandy from the beach and i might do an upload on that case in the future for sure but uh at any rate rest in peace sandy panzarella i also have in the beginning some um comparisons of Don Chaney's handwriting and of course that you know the sample from Don Chaney all comes from the letter he wrote to Tom Voigt because that's the only known sample out there I would love to have more and I put that out there because someone asked me on another video um, in the comment section an older one about Chaney's handwriting they said they didn't think it was that close and I said well I don't know what you're looking at but uh, you need to look at what I've seen and I go to the sample of the 177 or set or, or uh, number 77 uh, theory on Cheney's handwriting. Because if you look at the M's that Cheney writes in that letter to Tom Voigt and compare them to the M's in the uh, the letter the the uh, letter that had Paul Stein's bloody shirt piece in it, I think that was from um, I'm trying to remember what month in '69 that that letter. And uh, comparing those M's and the N's are so close, and they look like the number 177 when you look at those m's and another thing i put another sample up there of a d and i know the the most striking character in all the zodiac letters is the letter d because it's so slanted far to the right in all the zodiac correspondence and if you look at the one that uh, the d that don wrote in that sample i put up and you know it's don you know it's the sample from voight when you see that uh, graph paper behind it the little boxes and i think don did that to uh to stay in the boxes, to not slant his handwriting. Maybe that's a natural thing that he did to slant it. But if you look at the one D that Don wrote, you can tell he's resting the top part of that D against the line in the graph paper in the box. So as to not let it lean more to the right, looking more like the Zodiac D. And uh, there's no question that Don is manipulating his handwriting when he wrote that to Tom Voigt because there's no explanation why there would be in such a short little letter a par one paragraph letter, he's going to have four different distinct lowercase g's. There's just not. I mean, he's manipulating it. He knows he's sending this to a, a Zodiac researcher, but uh, he's definitely hiding some of his writing. But anyway, those samples I put up there are pretty interesting. And I don't I don't put a whole lot of stock into the handwriting. Um, but when you have a person of interest and he does is one of the better comparisons to the Zodiac writing, you're definitely going to put it out there. Why not? But uh, I know people talk about how Snook's handwriting being close and um, a couple other people. There was even Tahoe 27 pointed out one time. There was another, I think it was somebody else on the Napa police force that had even closer handwriting than Hal Snook to the Zodiacs. And she said, but this guy could not have whatsoever have been the killer. And, and she wasn't saying that he was. She just made the, the point that here's another sample from a totally different guy that was even close. So there's four or five suspects out there even dark horse ones that have pretty similar handwriting i mean ted kaczynski some of his is similar but a lot of it isn't so uh but i just i think cheney's is definitely there's something going on there the way he's trying to keep it in the boxes the different g's like i said but i don't know just look at those and uh my two favorite comparisons for cheney is that one letter that had stein shirt in it i can't remember the exact date on that one and also the uh, badlands letter and cover if you compare the badlands zodiac badlands letter which was never totally confirmed to be authentic 
Zodiac correspondence, but it's a good comparison. I think it's legit um, just because it's so close. But obviously, no one's going to question the one that contained the piece of Stein's shirt. I mean, that's obviously someone connected to the murder. So that's a that's a good one to get samples from. And speaking of Hal Snook, I put a photo of him in the beginning in the photo section. And uh, if you can go to uh, Ned's Black Box online radio channel, he does a lot about uh, the Zodiac hoax theory and Hal Snook and if Hal Snook is involved because he's part of that theory. And that particular photo of Hal Snook was taken in, uh, actually it was taken three days before the Paul Stein killing. So uh, that makes it kind of interesting. And in that photo, Snook is taking photos of a murdered eight-month-old boy, I believe, who was murdered by the father, and he's taking pictures of him. And the, you know, I think the the father put the the body in the back of a pickup truck, and Snook is taking the pictures of him. So, if that guy has any involvement in the Zodiac crimes, he's really twisted. You think you could get your your fill of murder from doing things like he did for a living? And uh, he's all over the nap of paper. Snook is that guy must have been really busy. I mean, he's working cases like that back to back. I mean, there was a lot of crime going on back in that that time period for whatever reason but uh he was working multiple cases back then but so really busy guy but uh thought that was an interesting photo of him in the back of that truck just really sad case on that one and also um there's some pictures of a uh, uh, gilbert and sullivan and i'll talk about that in that relation to the mikado and uh a little tie into don cheney on that but i wanted to get to the mailbag real quick and uh read a few of these real fast and there was one from Chris and I hope I'm saying your name right and he was going back to the uh, interview that Tom Voigt did with Don Chaney and thought it was really interesting that no one's ever pointed out how uh, in Chris's opinion is uh, you know Don basically admitting to being the Zodiac because uh, and I'm just paraphrasing this uh, part from that interview with Tom Voigt and obviously that whole transcript is on Voigt's website ZodiacKiller.com but um uh, I think Tom Voigt asked Don Cheney, you know, do, do, you, do you totally believe or something that Don that uh, Arthur Lee Allen was a Zodiac? And Don responds something like this. He said, I thought about it from time to time. And if Lee wasn't the Zodiac, it must have been a, someone that knew him well, like a friend or something like that. I'm paraphrasing that. But uh, in Chris's opinion, he's basically saying, yeah, you know, I'm basically telling you I'm that friend or I'm the Zodiac in a way. And then he says something, Don Cheney says uh, specifically, I am morally assured that Lee was the Zodiac killer, and um, which is kind of a strange comment. You know, if he was really telling you all these things, is early, and this is, remember, Don Cheney moved the timeline back a year to make it fit him better, but if you go with the, the date of Alan telling him all this on New Year's Day, 1969, how he was going to, you know, pick off the kitties as they come bouncing off the bus, and obviously that letter came out a long time later, you wouldn't be morally assured that it was Lee Allen. You would be absolutely sure that, that Lee Allen was the Zodiac killer. So um, he's right about that. There's all kinds of clues in that interview with Tom Voigt. And Tom, I give him a lot of credit. He asked some great questions. But there's other things that Cheney says in that interview. Like like Tom asked him, do you think they'll ever find the hood or anything if it was, if it was Arthur Lee Allen? And Don basically says, no, you'll never find it. He would have gotten rid of that. He says it with such confidence. I mean, I know this has been many years later, and it might be a safe bet that that stuff will never turn up, but he, Don says it with confidence. No, you'll never find any of that. I mean, just point blank. And then, you know, little things I said, like, obviously, one of my favorites, and I put this in the comment section to under his comment back to him, that was uh, the Blue Rock Springs comment where, where he... Uh, tells Tom Voigt, he says, what's Blue Rock Springs? I've never heard of Blue Rock Springs. And here a guy that was living in Concord for a while, which is right pretty close to that, never heard of Blue Rock Springs Park or, or a country club? Right. And then, of course, later on, we know he vividly recalls Blue Rock Springs when he says that Arthur Lee Allen drove him through there and showed him where he was going to kill some people. So, uh, so many... Uh, so many things like that with Don. He changed his story. He, he out and out lied when you compare certain things. There's no other way around it. So uh, there's really no neat reason to do that. Obviously, he's not telling the truth. But um, another good, that was just a good comment. So thank you for that. And then there's a comment here from Turner Magby. He says, Drew, keep posting. Found your channel last week. Listen to all your videos while at work. Been interested in the Zodiac case for a few years. And this channel is... By far the best info source. Don definitely is my new top suspect. Too much makes sense. 
Well, thank you, Turner. I definitely agree with you, and I really appreciate that comment. And everybody else that makes uh, comments like that, uh, I think that, that really keeps me going and makes me want to find new stuff. And I'm definitely, after I get this book done, I'll be uh, definitely uh, quadrupling the Zodiac research in, in the direction I'm going, because I have a lot of loose ends that I haven't even had a chance to follow up on, just stuff that, uh, just call it cutting room floor stuff that I still have that I've never released. And here's another one from the mailbag from Mark Gunn. He says, Drew, that picture of Don you showed a few Zodcasts ago, the one where he's on a boat, it's amazing how well it fits the physical description of the guy at Lake Berryessa. Overweight slash bulky looking with thick brown hair, just as Cecilia Shepard described to the police officer. I agree about the wig at Lake Berryessa. It couldn't have been as Brian Hartnell said the hair looked greasy. I don't think a wig would get greasy. Only real, real hair would. I think the whole wig idea comes from people that are convinced it was Lee. And it's the only way you can explain how a bald guy suddenly had long hair at Lake Berryessa. It's fiddling the evidence to make Lee fit. Yeah, there's that, there's that word fiddling there, Mark. Uh, fiddling and farting, like the Zodiac would say. But uh, that's a great comment. Uh, yeah, a wig would not get greasy. So that Brian Hartnell definitely said that comment that the hair looked greasy to him. And like I said before, uh, why would you wear a wig under a hood? I mean, any just go try a wig on and put it on your head. I mean, even if you were totally bald, put put the wig on with two sided tape. It it could it, you could get sweaty under that hood, or anything could happen where it would shift over your eyes. And why would the Zodiac do that when he's walking up to another man? I mean, even even though at that point he might not have realized till he stood up how tall Brian Hartnell was at six seven, because that would have scared anybody. You know, not as uh. It's kind of geeky looking as Hartnell did or not. I mean, at 6'7", you can do some damage no matter what. So I, I think if Hartnell had made a play on that gun like he thought about uh, briefly, he might have, uh, you know, had the advantage just because he was that tall. I mean, who knows? But uh, it would have been interesting how that would have turned out. But I agree. That's a great point about the, uh, the hair looking greasy and why would a wig be greasy. Here's another one real quick from the uh, mailbag from Classic Chevy Cat Black. And I'll just call you Cat from now on because I know that's what you uh, go by on your Instagram. But it says, Drew, do you know if Don Cheney had a drinking problem? Have you heard anything besides the story before the polygraph test? You mentioned he rarely stayed at a job for long. Maybe he drank and was asked to leave. Just a thought. And uh, that, that's another great question. I don't know if he had a drinking problem or not, but he was obviously definitely a drinker because his cat says... You know, they did get really drunk the day before that scheduled polygraph, so he'd be hung over the next day, which is actually pretty smart. Think about that. That'd be a great way to kind of just skew the whole thing. So uh, there's Don being, being you know, one step ahead or trying to hide things. So, uh, but uh, good question. I don't know if he had a drinking problem. I do know that he was a drinker, obviously. I know he preferred Olympia beer and uh, black velvet whiskey, and I put that as a response to Cat. Uh, in that comment, but yeah, he definitely was a drinker, but I don't know if he had a problem with it or not. I think as far as losing those jobs, I just kind of lean towards maybe he had a problem with authority, but, uh, you know, alcohol could have played into it, could have played into a lot of things. So I want to stick just to the theme of some of the inconsistencies and things that Don Cheney says, and, uh, I'll tie all this in, but this comes from Robert Graysmith's book, Zodiac. And this one's uh, titled for the paragraph. It says Friday, August 25th, 1967. And this is uh, uh, a quote from Don Chaney in the book. It says, In the summer of 1967, Lee and I went on a deer hunt north of the Bay Area, Chaney told me. I used to be an avid hunter, but I don't hunt anymore. That was when I was growing up, and that's what we did then. I didn't go hunting with him often because I really didn't think he was a superior hunting partner. I went a couple of times with him on a major deer hunt where we went and spent two or three days. A few other times, we just went out for the day to hunt small game. He was all right to fish with if you didn't have to hike. He wasn't that good on his feet. His, his feet hurt him. He had flat feet and was overweight. Sometimes he had gout. As for weapons, I had a Winchester model 88.308 NATO cartridge, but I don't remember what gun Lee had. So shows you, you know, obviously Cheney's familiar with the with his uh, hunting weapon and stuff like that. But it's funny that Cheney said I used to be an avid hunter, even when he was being interviewed for Gray Smith's book. Because I can tell you, Cheney was always an avid hunter. I mean, all through the 1980s, he was an avid hunter as per his son. So he's not being genuine at all there. 
And as you can see, he mentions again how bad Arthur Lee Allen had the gout in his feet. He couldn't walk around well. That's why he made a bad hunting partner. Well, if Don was so hell-bent on uh, framing Arthur Lee Allen as a Zodiac killer, why would he ever put a statement out there like that, that he couldn't walk well? Because surely Don knows, like the police did, that the walk down to where Brian and Cecilia were at Lake Berryessa was a pretty, pretty long hike down there and a pretty long hike back up the slope. So somebody with bad feet is not going to be doing that. So it just goes to prove Cheney did not want Allen to go all the way down for the crimes. He didn't. He just wanted to put enough suspicion over there as for cover for himself or maybe the tandem. But he did not want Allen to go all the way down. Maybe if he did, Allen could have came back and said, oh, we did this together or I think it's Don. Um, no, it's just he wanted to put enough suspicion on Allen. So when I see Cheney making statements like that and then talking about how bad Allen's feet were and, you know, not wanting to take Allen all the way down, it always makes me go back to why on October 6th, 1969, remember that's five days before Paul Stein is killed in the Presidio in San Francisco, why was Arthur Lee Allen questioned at his job? And at the time he was working for Elmer Cave Elementary School in Vallejo, he was questioned by Vallejo Police Detective John Lynch at school and, um, I don't know why and Lynch was questioning him about the uh, Lake Berryessa attack, which I don't know why Lynch was doing that because he worked for Vallejo PD and Berryessa was obviously in Napa County. But anyway, they said that's why he was questioning Allen about where his whereabouts were um, for the Lake Berryessa attack. I guess Lynch was there because he's still following on Blue Rock Springs, which was obviously in Vallejo. But why is Lynch questioning Allen so early on? Allen was a child molester. He had no... Uh, other than that incident with Spinelli back on, he had no other uh, incidents of violent crime anywhere near this time. So again, why was Lynch questioning him? And as it, most people follow this case in detail know, Lynch never could remember why. There's no records as to why Lynch went and questioned Allen. Was it a tip-off? Was uh, Did someone else call him? Was it uh, Phil Tucker, who never remembered doing it? If we only knew why... Uh, Detective John Lynch went to question Allen at his place of employment at that time on October 6th. If we only knew what brought him to do that, you could probably solve this case. Someone tipped him off to go do that. And of course, when Allen was interviewed, that's when he gave the whole story of, well, I was going to go to Berryessa that day, but I went up to Salt Point Ranch instead, or whatever he called, you know, up the coast. Salt Point is what it was called. And, you know, he said he changed his mind at the last minute. And then when he went to Salt Point, he said he saw a couple up there, but he couldn't remember the name of the couple, so that could never be verified. But he's already toying with the police on day one. But uh, even if you think that Allen was just that kind of person that wanted to jerk the police around, why did they go question him? Did Allen find out about Barry Essen and, and, and bring attention to himself? I mean, this guy was going around trying to be a child molester. Why does he want the police fooling with him at all? It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So... Uh, Here's another statement I want to read that came from uh, Zodiac on Mass from Gray Smith that Cheney says, which I think is also interesting. And this is this is Cheney talking about the time he came forward with about Arthur Leon, and, and that at this time he was working for his friend Sandy Panzarella that we talked about earlier. But Cheney says, I was the operations manager at Science Dynamics, hiring and firing, managing the key punch department and 12 girls, two couriers that made all our pickups and deliveries in Los Angeles County and three or four boys in the mailroom to handle the logistics of the paper. I was responsible for all the material logistics. We had another team that ran the computer part of the business. Of course, I used computers in structural analysis and pipe stress, but was never a computer guy. Then one day, the subject of Star came up again, and I finally told Sandy of my suspicions. Of course, Star is uh, Arthur Lee Allen uh, that Grace Smith called Robert Hall Star in his book. But what I want to point there to in this statement from Cheney, first of all, is he says... Uh, he says 12 girls, and then he said, you know, that he's managing as the boss, and he says four boys. So there he goes. He's talking about adults here. I mean, these aren't like uh, school age kids doing this stuff. He's talking about boys and girls, and that's very Zodiac like in his correspondence. Of course, you know, he would refer to singularly as the boy or the girl, such as when the Zodiac wrote about the Lake Herman Road shooting, and he's talking about uh, Betty Lou Jensen, and he says the girl, and he's talking about the slack dress. So that uh, sounds like the Zodiac. 
And this came from, uh, I don't remember where I got this, one of the Zodiac sites, I think, but it says, Zodiac referred to his victims as the boy and the girl when speaking of them in the singular, or as a collective group would tell Nancy Slover, they'll find kids in a brown car. The fact that this killer refers to his victims as boy, girl, or kids is suggestive of, suggestive of himself, not of similar age, and refers to a boy and girl because that's how he sees them and uses the term to distinguish them from himself as an older adult. But you see that over and over. And uh, in the His Name Was Arthur Lee Allen video, I know Cheney refers to... Uh, He's talking about Arthur Lee Allen telling him about how he's going to do these tricks and the thing about the car and the wheel, uh, like what happened to Kathleen Johns. He said it was never going to be a man. He said it was always going to be a girl. So there he goes from man to girl. He doesn't say man to woman. He says man to girl. He said this was never going to be done to a man. It was always going to be a girl. So that's that's really telling of uh, some things that comes come out of Don Chaney in his own quotes. You know, he doesn't give up many but he does give up some, which brings me to the next one. So also going back to the uh, His Name Was Arthur Lee Allen video and Don Cheney, he uses a word in there, which is pretty uncommon. He uses the word cogitated. And that's when he was talking about going forward to the police with his allegations uh, about Arthur Lee Allen. Of course, he says he went to the Pomona police first, where he was living at the time. And that's obviously close to Riverside in Los Angeles. And he says... You know, I thought about it. He goes, I cogitated, you know, I stewed about it, you know, but he uses that word cogitated as a verb. That is extremely rare use of the word cogitate to say cogitated as a verb or using the word cogitate at all. It's not very common. I have a, a writing degree. I have a bachelor of science in writing. I, I don't think I had ever heard that word cogitated till I saw that video. It's just not really used anymore. I'm 51 years old. I've never I really ever could recall ever hearing that word. When you hear how Cheney uses it in the video, you understand what it means because he says stewed about it, cogitated. You know, he's obviously, he's struggling to, to, uh, to make that decision to go forward about Alan. And so, um, anyway, it's just odd. He uses this word cogitated because, you know, Cheney comes off as this kind of blue collarish guy. Obviously he's educated at what he did as a mechanical engineer, but doesn't seem to be real heavy into grammar or English, but he uses this word cogitated. And that's just not common to, to, to use that word at all. And people go into all this, Oh, the Zodiac must be English. Cause he said, uh, happy Christmas. And, there's some theory about him being Canadian or some nonsense, but um, Cheney using that word cogitated is is indicative of what maybe he was exposed to. And one place you can find that word, and I don't know if he took it from this uh, particular instance, but it's possible, but it's a good example. And there is a book called uh, The Sword on the Wall, and this is about the Mikado, and it says Japanese Elements and Their Significance in the Mikado by Michael Beckerman. And let me read the first paragraph. It says, According to Gilbert and Sullivan mythology, the idea for the Mikado occurred to Gilbert when a Japanese sword hanging on the wall of his study fell to the floor. Unlike many mythological events, this one does not appear to have any basis in reality. Gilbert was inspired by a sword, but it remained on the wall. Yet the more dramatic story is repeated endlessly in the literature and lovingly embellished. In one source, the sword falls with a clatter. In another, Gilbert took the sword in his hand and began to cogitate, uh, while elsewhere the weapon is merely said to have, and I, I, can't, I don't really know what the rest says because it cuts it off there, but um, so there you have it. I mean, he said that Gilbert had the sword in his hand and he began to cogitate, and that's how he somehow came up with this idea to write the Mikado. But uh, that quote actually... Uh, is repeated in Beckerman's book, but it originally comes from S.J. Adair Fitzgerald's The Story of the Savoy Opera in New York, 1923, pages 107 and 108. So just Cheney using the word cogitated tells you he's exposed to some form of other literature because a guy like that who has this blue-collar atmosphere type of guy, uh, beer drinker dude, using the word cogitated is just not not normal. There's, there's more there. It, it's a little more telling of things that, that he was influenced by. So, uh, definitely worth looking into. So that's all I have for today. Please subscribe, please buy my book. And if you have already, please review it on amazon.com. I'll promise I'll have some more good stuff next week. Thanks for listening. Bye.